O Centro Alemão de Ciência e Inovação de São Paulo Paulo faz parte de uma rede de cinco centros. Nós temos um centro em Nova York, um em Moscou, um em Nova Delhi e um em Tóquio. E essa rede de centros está hoje dentro do DAD. O DAD é o Serviço Alemão de Intercâmbio Acadêmico. E nós somos uma organização que representa as instituições do ensino superior na Alemanha. E nosso objetivo é de promover a internacionalização dos estudos superiores no mundo inteiro. O encontro das pessoas, dos grupos de pesquisadores das universidades é muito importante e isso é uma base da nossa cooperação com o Brasil mesmo. A cooperação entre duas comunidades científicas é muito produtiva, em geral causando impactos sempre maiores do que iniciativas de pesquisa feitas isoladamente. A Deveirá, como a sociedade científica aqui, que tem uma ciência de excelência absoluta e alta tecnologia, é extremamente proveitosa essas parcerias. E a parceria entre o setor privado e o mundo científico é fundamental para promover as relações bilaterais. Hello, good morning to Brazil, good afternoon to Germany. Are you uh, hearing me good? I hope so. So, uh, sorry for the short delay, uh, but uh, we were, so one of our speakers uh, is having, uh, have, has problem with the connection. So, hello to everybody who is joining us for the very first Beha São Paulo online talk. My name is Márcio Weichert and I hope you enjoy, you, you enjoy it, the short video about our institution, the German Center for Research and Innovation in São Paulo. The VIH, as we spell our acronym in German, as you need, and you need to agree with me that it's easier than in Portuguese. The VIH, the WIH, or in English, the WIH. So you see, German is not that difficult. Before we start, I need to inform you that this online talk is being recorded, including the chat conversation, and the video will be published later in our channel on YouTube. Participating in the event means that you agree with recording and publishing. Your personal data that you use to log in will be deleted from the database after the transmission and won't be used for marketing or other purposes. So, as you could note in the video, the German Center for Research and Innovation is a platform to foster the scientific cooperation between researchers and research organizations from Germany and Brazil, as well as with innovators, science-based startups, companies with research and development, and so on, in both countries. In order to achieve our goal, we usually host events promoting knowledge exchange and bringing together potential cooperation actors. The Bay Has São Paulo organizes or supports around 20 events per year. 2020, as you know, became a very unusual year due to COVID-19 pandemic. More than a half of our events were postponed to next year and many other projects are happening online as this one. Going online with our recently created series TV Ha São Paulo Online Talks is the way to continue to fulfill our goal, offering a communication and exchange track between the scientific and academic community in Brazil and Germany. We should surviving, living and shaping the future in the time of COVID-19 as the topic for the first series. It couldn't be different, could it? Almost everything this year has to do with the current reality and with the near future. 
The future depends on how humanity is taking the challenge of the new coronavirus and COVID-19. To have the upper hand, we need to understand who we are facing. That's why research is so fundamental in this moment. We plan this first online talk service with a sequence of three meetings. In this first one today, we face the need of surviving against the new coronavirus and COVID-19. In the second event, we will discuss changes and effects in, the, in our everyday lives during this pandemic. And in the last meeting of the first series, we will look to the future after this pandemic. Imagine how it will seem, how we want it can be, and how we can build it. For this year, we are organizing two sequences about surviving, living and shaping the future in the time of COVID-19. The meetings have an interval of two or three weeks between them, and uh, the series should be closed on 11 November. We will keep our scientific calendar on our website and our social media updated. So, stay tuned. Now, before I hand over to our moderator, I want to conduct a short survey with you. You will see two questions appear on screen. We would appreciate if you could answer them. They will stay open for 30 seconds. So for 30 seconds. In the chat, you can complete the first question about reforming your city. We are very curious to know in which city and country you are. So you have 30 seconds. Please inform the chat as well uh, your city and country. So, the time is up and I have talked enough. It's time to hear our invited speakers, Professor Stefan Lutwisch from the University of Münster and Dr. Sotiris Misailidis from the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, well known as Fio Cruz in Rio de Janeiro. To introduce them, I want to invite the chair of this online talk, Professor Marcos Berkerich. Director of the Institute of Biosciences at the University of São Paulo, USP. As our invited speakers, Marcus is currently very engaged in actions in the battle against the new coronavirus and COVID-19. Please, Marcus, this virtual stage is yours. Marcus? Marcus, you need to... Sorry, do you, do you have my, my audio now? I have your, your audio, yes. But uh, not your... your image. Match, yes. Now, okay, so... Welcome, yeah. Marcus. Uh, thank you very much, Marcio. Uh, uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce our speakers today. Um, uh, good morning to, to the Brazilians and guten tag to, to our friends in Germany. Uh, today we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Stefan uh, Ludwig uh, from, from Münster I University. Uh, and Professor Sotiris uh, Misailidis 
uh, who is now the vice director of the technological development of uh, Fio Cruz, the, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. Uh, and uh, the things that they are going to talk about are, Professor Ludwig will talk about the, the hunt for drug against uh, COVID-19. And uh, Professor Soltiris uh, will speak about the initiatives of uh, Fio Cruz in Brazil uh, uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, professor Ludwig is a full professor and director of the Institute of Virology of the University of Münster. Uh, he, he has completed uh, his undergraduate and graduate studies in chemistry, virology, and molecular biology at the University of Gießen uh, and received the habilitation in molecular biology from the medical uh, faculty of the University of Würzburg. Uh, at Münster University, he was uh, appointed vice rector of the research and deputy of the rector. This was from 2009 and 2016. And uh, since 2008, he holds a position as a spokesperson of its research council. Uh, Professor Ludwig is a member of several committees uh, and uh, boards from prominent research centers, publications, and councils, including uh, uh, in 2020, the funded pandemic Commission of the German uh, Research, uh, the, the Pandemic Commission of the German Research Foundation, uh, DFG. Uh, he is also a co founder of uh, and head of the advisory board of Atriva Therapeutics, GmbH. Uh, Professor Stefan, uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. so I start sharing my screen. Now you should also see me. <laughs> Thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction. Thank you, Markus. Um, and hello, everybody um, on yes, this side we'll and you, uh, that side of uh, the Atlantic. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've been. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, to to join this event here. Um, as uh, some people may, or Marcio, of course, will know, we met a, a lot of times. Um, I was actually involved in the funding of the Brazil Center at the University of Münster and had the chance to visit Brazil uh, and the D, uh, DWIH uh, a lot of time. I've also uh, joined the funding ceremony and. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see that it's still alive and there's still a lot of actions going on. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I was uh, asked to present something on, on COVID-19, uh, which is also connected to uh, the work we are doing at our institute and uh, chosen to tell you a little bit uh, on, on drug development against COVID-19. Uh, and I think um, the next speaker, Dr. Misalidis, uh, we'll talk more about the vaccine. So we have both uh, sides of the story here, drugs and, and vaccines, which are, are covered in a way. Before um, I start with the actual drug issue, I want to give you a very, very brief overview and in that what coronaviruses are. Uh, so coronavirus are a positive strand RNA virus. That means that their genome can directly uh, encode for viral proteins. Uh, they are special uh, in a way because they have a very, very large RNA genome of 27 to 30 KB. And actually, since RNA polymerases are rather error prone, this uh, is really curious because actually such a big genome should be genetically uh, quite unstable. Uh, it is not actually the coronaviruses are uh, quite uh, evolutionarily quite stable. Um, and uh, they, of course, in 30 KB, you can uh, code a lot of different proteins, which makes also their replication cycle quite uh, special. On the right side of the slide, uh, actually, can you see my my pointer here, or probably not? Uh, but here, uh, in, on the upper right side, 
of the slide, uh, there is an electron uh, microscopy picture of a coronavirus. This is actually uh, a SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the picture had be, has been taken at the Robert Koch Institute in, in Berlin, Germany. And uh, what you can nicely see here that uh, the, the particle is surrounded by something which looks like a crown in a way. In a way. And this uh, also uh, is the reason why these viruses uh, are called coronaviruses. Actually, uh, corona comes from, from crown. Uh, these are spherical particles, 120 nanometer, 250 nanometers. And they are classified uh, in the order of uh, needle um, virales. Uh, and uh, we have subgenera alpha coronavirus, beta, gamma, and delta coronavirus. And for a, for coronaviruses are actually known for, for a long time already. Um, we know common coronaviruses uh, from the groups like HCOV uh, NL63 or HCOV 229E um, already since the 60s. So these are actually four types of viruses which are circulated as, as quite mild common cold viruses in the population. However, in uh, 2002, for the first time, uh, a, a zoonotic and highly pathogenic uh, coronaviruses derived, which was then called the, the SARS coronaviruses. And as you see here in the, in the lower part of the slide, um, we recorded uh, worldwide 8,422 cases and uh, around 900 deaths in 32 different countries. Uh, so that was a, already quite um, a, a threatening uh, event. Uh, then only like 10 years later, a second spillover from the animal uh, kingdom, from the viruses from animals to humans occurred, uh, which is called the Middle East Respiratory Coronavirus. And uh, there we, uh, we observed 2,500 uh, cases uh, in, in roughly 850 deaths uh, from 27 different countries. And um, only these few years later, in 2019, we now have the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, as you can directly see, the number are uh, in a much higher dimension. Uh, I've looked up the numbers this morning, and we are up to around 18 uh, million, 18.5 million cases worldwide, which were recorded, uh, so confirmed cases and already over 700,000 deaths in 188 different countries. So this is a real severe pandemic, which happens worldwide. And if, if you look at uh, the development, since like 2002, we only had uh, this mild uh, common corona, uh, common cold coronaviruses. But now already in, in a period of around 20 years, we had three times the emergence of highly pathogenic coronaviruses. Which, which really groups them together with influenza viruses uh, in those kind of viruses that, that, that really uh, have a uh, high pandemic potential. And we are in the middle of, of such a um, pandemic potential, uh, pa a pandemic now. Um, so um, actually there's no drug so far, um, which has specifically developed to be highly active against corona uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And uh, there's still uh, no, no vaccine. Uh, however, a lot of things are going on. So we have probably around 150 different vaccine approaches that had, has never happened before that so many companies and, and scientists were involved in the development of vaccines, different, uh, different uh, strategies here. And we have uh, all about the same number of uh, drug developmental programs at, against uh, the viruses. So this, uh, this is uh, all rather promising, and uh, we, we might see something uh, specific and highly effective coming up here in the next, uh, in the next year or so. Um, if, if we talk about drug development against SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have to first uh, have a look on, on the disease progression, how the disease is, is going on. And actually, uh, there is a very nice overview uh, paper from Zidiki and Mera in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant, uh, where you can see that uh, the, 
the COVID-19 disease comes in different stages. Uh, we have a first stage, uh, which is dominated by the virus itself. And in that stage, the virus uh, is actually responsible for the harm uh, it, it does. And, and so uh, drugs that uh, target the virus would mainly act there. Um, but what you also see is that in the, in the second stage, there is another um, mode of uh, disease progression going on, namely that we have an overinduction of the host inflammatory response. And at stage three, there's actually no virus present anymore. And, and the, the curve you see in the middle, this is the severity of, uh, of the illness. And you can see that this hyperinflammation phase uh, has the highest uh, disease severity However, there's no virus uh, anymore. All, everything is driven by uh, the immune pathogenesis, which was initially induced by the virus, but the virus is, is not uh, relevant in that phase anymore. And this, of course, determines the, uh, the mode of action of, uh, of um, a potential drug uh, in the first stages. It should be more directed against the virus itself. Uh, however, such a drug would not be very helpful in, this, uh, in the third stage when a virus is, is present anymore. And um, <clears throat> I, will, I will go to different um, strategies which are um, pursued there in the moment. Uh, of course, I cannot, I cannot mention all uh, 200 or 150 or 200 uh, developmental programs, but now I've uh, picked a few which are uh, either could not um, hold the promise or are uh, quite promising in, in their results on the viruses. And uh, it's probably not a surprise that uh, the, the most advanced drugs, which are now already uh, at least in part in clinical trials in, in humans, that these are drugs which uh, are not from, um, developed from scratch uh, but these are drugs that are already uh, used or were developed for other diseases or for uh, against other virus infections. And uh, so one, one of these drugs which actually were, were thought, or drug combinations which actually were thought to be promising, is lip, uh, lopinavir and the ritonavir in a combination. And this is actually a, a, a drug combination which is used uh, against HIV viruses to, to actually um, uh, do AIDS thera therapies. And uh, the, the drug was actually, this drug combination was actually um, further developed since there were a few promising data, however, without any um, like uh, blinded and, and anonymized um, clinical trials from China that the drug uh, combination might work. Um, but actually, uh, in that paper here by Kao et al., which was uh, published in the Journal of Experimental uh, Journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, sorry, uh, in March 22, there was already uh, showed that uh, in, a, in a controlled clinical trial, there was no uh, special. A benefit, uh, at least not in a significant manner, uh, observed. Um, the drawback of that study was uh, that these drugs, lopinavir and ritonavir, are probably directly um, targeting the virus itself. So lopinavir is a protease inhibitor, and it, uh, it inhibits the HIV protease, but it was also uh, believed that it might inhibit also a, a thus a cov 2 protease because these proteases are needed for the virus to, to cleave their polyprotein. And, and that was actually the rationale to, uh, to use it. Uh, what that would mean is uh, that uh, this drug combination is more or less directed against the virus and not against the overshooting immune response. However, in these in trials, um, the, the patients used uh, were actually uh, very severely diseased and probably already in a phase where the virus might not take uh, or might not um, be so relevant anymore. Uh, so it, it might be that if one would go earlier in the disease 
a staging with that drug, it, it may still have a helpful event. Um, a second group of, uh, of compounds um, you might all have heard of is, is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there was actually given a, a quite a bit of, of uh, hope in, in these drugs. What these drugs do, uh, at least in vitro, they interfere with the cellular receptor of SARS-CoV-2, namely ACE2. And uh, most importantly, they also um, in, uh, impair the acidification of endosomes. Uh, this is a, um, an event which is needed for the uptake of many different viruses, including, for example, also influenza viruses and, and all the, the coronaviruses, of course. And uh, so it was thought that uh, these drugs uh, may inhibit entry of the virus. And accordingly, it could be shown that in cell lines, uh, it, uh, the compound hydroxychloroquine acted quite nicely as an, as an antiviral with a, a quite um, yeah, promising EC50, so the effective concentration to inhibit 50% of the virus was down to 1.7 micromolar, which is quite a, a, a good concentration. How, uh, and also in a, in a first uh, non-randomized open-label study, uh, uh, the, the authors uh, uh, around Paul Gautre in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents have shown uh, that there is a, a reduced uh, percentage of PCR uh, positive uh, specimen, uh, which gave a, a quite a hope in these drugs. However, and, and you may have heard it in, uh, in the news, um, there were then a lot of follow-up studies and uh, one um, review article uh, showed uh, this is a, an article by Ale uh, Alexander and colleagues uh, showed uh, that most of these studies had uh, uh, poor study quality and only provided uh, uh, insufficient evidence for foreign action. And and later on, it was um, found uh, that the, in these studies, the um, side effects were more severe than the benefit against COVID-19. So actually chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are, are no promising agents, uh, uh, could not be considered as promising agents anymore. Although there are some presidents around the world to still claim uh, that one should take these drugs. I would recommend not to do that. Um, oops, next slide. Um, some other drug developments which I find promising um, use the newly collected data on uh, the, uh, the entry process of uh, the virus. And uh, a study by Hoffmann and colleagues in Cell uh, showed that SARS-CoV-2 uses the same entry receptor, namely ACE2, uh, as an as an entry receptor, the same uh, as, SARS, as the first SARS-CoV uh, virus, and for the entry, it is required that the spike protein, which binds to the entry receptor ACE2, the viral spike protein, has to be cleaved by a protease called TMPRSS2. Um, this is shown here on the left side in this in this sketch, and uh, both compounds. Um, where thus be considered as, uh, as like cellular targets to inhibit entry of the virus. Uh, there is one drug which is called APN01. This is a recombinant soluble form of uh, ACE2, of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it's thought that this, uh, this soluble form would catch the virus before it can attack cells and, and uh, inactivate it. And this is uh, phase two clinical trials have uh, already started with that uh, drug uh, that is done by Aperian Biologics. And uh, the interesting thing here is that ACE2 might by that not only inhibit the virus, but also has uh, a certain anti-inflammatory activity, which could 
uh, be beneficial in the in this the third stage of um, the disease. Um, accordingly, there was also studies done with an inhibitor of TMPRSS2. Uh, this is Camostat, a serin protease inhibitor, and this will, was already uh, licensed in Japan for a completely different disease by Ono Pharmaceuticals, namely for chronic pancreatitis. And, and now phase two trials uh, against COVID-19 are planned, and this is also quite a, a promising uh, approach. However, um, they're still in the uh, in the uh, clinical phase two clinical evaluation. Now let me switch to the next slide. Uh, two other antiviral agents uh, were thought to be really promising, uh, and these are so-called nucleoside analogs. What do these nucleoside analogs does? They they are actually wrongly composed uh, building blocks of viral nucleic acids, and uh, once such a, a wrongly formed a nucleoside is built in by uh, an advancing uh, RNA chain, uh, it, it stops the prolongation of the RNA and thereby inhibits uh, the the viral polymerase activity. And uh, one of these compounds is favipiravir. Favipiravir has been shown to, to be very active against influenza viruses, surprisingly specific against these viruses, but later was, were found to also inhibit other RNA viruses, uh, including um, Ebola viruses, for example. Um, in, in first preclinical studies, it, it was shown that it was um, more potent than uh, lopinavir ritonavir, the, the uh, HIV drug. And then also in a study, uh, first clinical trial um, with 80 patients, uh, there was an antiviral activity shown. However, in a, uh, a more advanced trial, the, the compound failed. Um, and and then the, the, the results of the latest clinical trials are that uh, there is not a, a significant uh, benefit obtained with that agent. This is different uh, with a, another nucleoside uh, prodrug, um, remdesivir. And uh, here, in fact, uh, the results of the latest trial have shown uh, that the uh, compound uh, leads to reduced time to recovery. However, it, it had no effect on the death rate. Um, it, it's approved now in the US uh, and, and also in Europe for um, like emergency use in, in a, a very diseased patients. Um, the the re results seen in the trials may be again explained in this phasing model of the disease um, because uh, the, the uh, effect on the death rate would mean if you have very highly um, or severely uh, diseased uh, patients, they would probably be in the last phase of the disease where an antiviral agent uh, would not be effective anymore. So it, it might be wise to consider remdesivir also for people uh, which are um, still in the stage where the virus uh, replication still is going on to reduce uh, this um, um, virus uh, spread. Um, uh, something where is also, uh, or where they also had been given a lot of hope in, are so called convalescent sera. So, what's uh, done there is that uh, blood is taken from um, actually cured people who survived the disease uh, because they should have actually antibodies. Uh, against uh, the uh, the virus in their blood, and this is then given uh, back the sera or the, the the plasma of these patients back to diseased patients. This is uh, something which uh, is commonly used in, uh, in in some infectious diseases and and showed uh, success here. However, so far there was not a, a clear evidence of the benefit, which may have something to do with the quality of the sera or the plasma used, uh, because it's not really clear at which stage of recovery the antibody uh, amount in the blood uh, is really uh, in a, on a level that is neutralizing for the virus. So um, although it, it's 
in the moment not, not really clear. I would uh, really think uh, that it's worse to follow up uh, that line uh, further on and, and take a closer look there. However, of course, this is a, a something which only can be used uh, in, in the clinics on highly diseased patients. This is nothing which can be broadly used in, in the population uh, because uh, the, simply the number of CIRA are very limited. So uh, with that, I want to switch over to drugs which are uh, not targeting the virus or, or virus uh, uh, interfering cellular proteins, but uh, targeting like, uh, like the overshooting immune response. And here interleukin-6 is a cytokine, uh, which is actually a master player in the cytokine network and really a driver of these uh, highly um, inflammatory disease. And um, so uh, several attempts were uh, had been taken uh, to use drugs which are already in the clinic, like uh, tocilizumab or also sarilumab, uh, which are um, recombinant antibodies actually uh, or recombinant blockers uh, of the interleukin-6 receptor and, and thereby blocking uh, the function of, inter of the high amounts of interleukin-6 in the blood. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the data here um, were also not that promising in the latest trials. And according to a protocol by the NIH, uh, from June uh, that's 2016, this is of course not true, this is 2020, um, say that uh, there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of these inhibitors for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, so there are still um, trials going on and people probably have, will have a closer look at that. However, so far uh, there is, is not a clear uh, statement on, of, on how effective such a drug uh, might be. Um, a, a compound which also interferes with the overshooting immune response is dexamethasone. And this is actually a cheap and widely available steroid, which is uh, commonly used uh, to treat um, inflammatory diseases like asthma, like allergies, and other forms of inflammation. and. Uh, in a, in a study in England, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine from July, uh, they did a really big study um, on more than 6,000 people. Uh, it was shown that uh, dexamethasone reduces the, the death rate by one third in patients on ventilators and one fifth, sorry for the, the miss, uh, for the, uh, the typos here. Um, in one fifth uh, in patients on, on oxygenation. So this was actually a study which showed for the first time that a drug, uh, although it's, it's, it's cheap and, and rather broadly acting on, on inflammation, uh, could rescue people from death. So this is the, the, the first drug uh, against uh, COVID-19, which has been shown to rescue people from, from dying. Uh, however, uh, it is, really important to consider the timing of the treatment. Uh, this drug uh, is uh, recommended only for the use in patients which are in a very late stage of the disease. Uh, and, and this is, of course, um, something uh, which can easily be, uh, could be understood because there you have this high inflammatory uh, response. But for these types of um, diseased patients, there is really promising evidence that dexamethasone uh, could be a, a helpful agent. However, again, it's not specific uh, and uh, it, 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 it targets more the immune response than uh, the virus. So uh, with that, I want to, to come back for the last few slides to uh, that what we are doing um, at, at the incident, the, the, this is uh, in that part, really, in the in the preclinical stage, um, so we are uh, doing studies uh, to target both types of or, or both stage one and stage three of the uh, of the disease. The first 
uh, stage, uh, it is also known that there is a, a insufficient immune response here. Uh, and uh, here we, we try type 1 interferon treatment uh, on different diseases. We do that in, in a newly developed uh, human lung tissue explant model, which actually has been developed in the lab by a, a postdoc from, from Fiocruz, Aline Matos. She did a great job on, on uh, influenza in these uh, studies. <clears throat> and in another project, we are looking for the action of uh, clinically uh, licensed or, or in development uh, being uh, P38 MEPK inhibitors in, in a kind of a repurposing approach because it's known that P38 MEP kinase is involved in overshooting cytokine responses. The most advanced uh, project in the lab, however, uh, is a, a compound which is called ATR002. Unfortunately, my institute logo has messed up here on the left side. And this is something we are developing with a startup company um, uh, called Atriva. And it's a, a kinase inhibitor. And the interesting thing here is that this kinase inhibitor has uh, also a dual mode of action um, because the kinase is both uh, involved in replication processes of the virus, but also in the overshooting cytokine response. So it acts and on both stages, uh, namely antiviral in the first place and anti-inflammatory in the second place. Uh, we actually started out to develop that drug against influenza and there's a, a very promising phase one clinical trial that showed safety and tolerability in humans already finalized. Uh, we also have a full clinically developed, uh, preclinical development uh, data package as a, as a flu agent. Um, but now in first uh, studies, we could show that the drug also acts directly antiviral against uh, SARS-CoV-19. And accordingly, we are now planning a phase two clinical trial against COVID-19, which should start in September 2020. And uh, we hope that that we will be successful with that uh, because we we have a drug here which really could target several stages of of the disease uh, and thereby may have a, a higher benefit than the ex existing drugs with that i hope i did not overdo my time with that i want to thank you for your attention and um, i'm open for questions Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you all hear me? Uh, uh, Thank you, Professor Ludwig, uh, uh, for the presentation. I will uh, first uh, uh, ask for Professor Sotiris to make his presentation, uh, and then we can open we can open for questions for for the two presenters. Uh, Professor uh, Sotiris uh, brings thirty years of experience in applied research focused on development of uh, therapeutic and diagnostic applications. Uh, Professor Sotiris is a trained biologist uh, with an MSc and a PhD in chemistry from the University of York uh, and a postdoctoral studies in pharmaceutical sciences in Nottingham and molecular biology in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, he was an academic at the Open University UK and visiting professor of the universities of, uh, universities of Lisbon in Portugal and Paris in France, as well as uh, uh, the, universe, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and the State University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and the uh, EACR Fellow at the University of Patras in Greece. He was founder and director of uh, Eusodia Limited in the UK company, uh, at Pio Cruz, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil, he worked as a senior researcher at the Osvaldo Cruz Institute 
and uh, biomanguinhos, or as we say here, biomanguinhos. Uh, he's currently director of the technological development of Biomanguinhos, Institute of Technology and Immunobiologics of the Fiocruz, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. Uh, Professor uh, Sotiris, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? So, um, excellent. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for the opportunity. Yes, uh, we can hear you. To Present, Don't see your image. Uh, you our work could. at Biomanguinhos Institute uh, at the Fiocruz Foundation. Um, it's important to say that uh, Biomanguinhos is a, a public health institute. is linked to the Ministry of Health. Um, here on the on the left there is a photo of uh, Biomanguinhos site, and the and the castle is the symbol of the Fiocruz Foundation, which is probably the biggest public health foundation uh, in, in the world. Um, so, as we're part of the Ministry of Health, we we had to anticipate uh, the necessities of the Ministry of Health and then work with them to provide solutions uh, for the Brazilian uh, public. And uh, the first thing we, we started doing ever since um, the pandemic started uh, at the end of last year, or the beginning of January, uh, was uh, looking at the diagnostic part um, because the diagnostic testing is the first step in, in a chain reaction uh, that impacts on preparedness and strategic response. And we saw that the countries that um, took their diagnostic testing serious, seriously uh, had a very much better response uh, than the countries um, that didn't. So uh, our first step was uh, to develop uh, molecular diagnostic testing uh, that could test um, for the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, looking at the, the RNA, it's a PCR-based test. Uh, we used two different protocols, uh, the Berlin uh, and the CDC, the US protocol. As a first line, we use the Berlin uh, test, and if we needed a confirmatory, um, the CDC. Now, we started with, uh, we started within the development, uh, we prepared the molecular biology testing, we uh, produced, registered and produced that, uh, and we started um, from a production of 3,000 tests per week, we managed to escalate it to 250,000 and now to half a million tests per week. So we, we can produce up to two million per month for the Brazilian uh, Ministry of Health. And we established testing facilities so uh, we could also uh, help on the testing itself. Uh, the second part was uh, testing for patient antibodies and uh, it was uh, the development of point of care testing in collaboration with US and Korean companies. Uh, and that, in contrast to, to the RNA test, doesn't look for the virus itself. So it doesn't focus on the, on the primary and the acute phase of the disease. It focuses on the development of uh, antibodies of the patient. And that is very important for uh, returning to, to a normal life. It's very important for testing. Uh, before companies come back to work, uh, for whom has the antibodies already, who has been infected, uh, considering that a number of cases are asymptomatic. Um, now, uh, my colleagues covered uh, in, in great detail the therapeutic part, so I'll mostly focus uh, my presentation on the vaccine development. 
uh, both uh, worldwide and at uh, Fiocruz. Um, this is the picture of, uh, of the scenario uh, worldwide. We have we started with 150 different vaccines. We're now at 266. Uh, we have 186 biological therapeutics, 137 small molecules, and some phytotherapic, theragnostics. Uh, and the majority of them, as you see on, on the right side of the picture, are specific for COVID-19. But we also have some that uh, aim to address COVID and SARS uh, or COVID, MERS, and SARS, or uh, just MERS. Um, and these ones are all in different clinical, in different stages of development. Another important uh, factor uh, that I think is very relevant uh, during this pandemic is the accelerated development that, uh, that the whole world uh, adopted. So a vaccine development project is usually something between three and eight to ten years. Uh, and in this case, uh, the whole world aimed to develop something between 12 and 18 months. Uh, to do that, a lot of stages were not really uh, overcome or bypassed, but they were accelerated or they passed from being ser uh, in series uh, used in parallel. Uh, that increased the risk and uh, increased the cost of development, but obviously permits uh, a much uh, more rapid uh, development of a vaccine. So here is um, uh, a sort of traditional route to development. You have the research, target selection, target to hit, hit to lead, lead optimization, preclinical studies, phase one, phase two, phase three, registration, and then at the stage of registration, you start large-scale manufacturing. And then you have uh, technology transfer licensing and uh, phase four, uh, follow-up uh, clinical studies. Uh, in the, the actual situation, we had to accelerate all that. A lot of research was based on previous uh, influenza or SARS and MERS studies. Uh, so the preclinical and target uh, definition was very, uh, very rapid. Uh, the clinical development had a lot of um, uh, overlapping. So we have a lot of companies conducting phase one, phase two, or phase two, phase three together. Uh, and the large scale manufacturing started already at the middle of the phase two, right at the end of the phase one, uh, at the middle of the phase three or even at the phase two clinical trials with no guarantee that the product would be effective, that the vaccine would be effective. The companies uh, and the governments and fu with funding from uh, multi with multinational organizations like CEPI, Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, World Health Organization, they started uh, organizing large-scale manufacturing before we have uh, clinical uh, phase three data. Uh, that guarantees that at the end of the phase three, if, uh, if everything goes well, we'll have immediately a uh, vaccine uh, available for everybody. At the same time, obviously, there is a risk of uh, paying for a production of a vaccine that may not prove to be uh, efficacious and therefore uh, it's sort of lost. But everybody is, uh, is, is hoping for the best and is, uh, is betting uh, to a certain extent on, on the current approaches. And there is a number of, uh, of different approaches um, and products in development. As I said, we have um, uh, 260 something uh, different vaccine approaches. 233, 32 are just for COVID-19. The majority of them are uh, what we call protein subunit vaccines. They're based on, uh, on proteins, recombinant proteins uh, of the virus produced in different platforms. Uh, 
Uh, second follows up the nucleic acid vaccines, both uh, DNA and RNA. We have the va viral vector vaccines using different vectors, in most cases adenovirus, to deliver and produce uh, a COVID uh, protein in the organism. We have some synthetic vaccines uh, based on synthetic peptides, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, inactivated, virus inactivated vaccines, chimeric, cell based, and live attenuated. So there is a whole uh, number of uh, different approaches. Here is the, the current state of clinical uh, trials. Uh, the first one, the more advanced, is the University of Oxford uh, with a technology that's now licensed to AstraZeneca as well. This is at phase two and phase three clinical studies. And uh, there is a number of clinical studies conducted worldwide. We have a, a branch in Brazil, a clinical uh, study phase three with 5,000 individuals participating. Uh, there is another one in the US with 30,000 uh, 30, people and in different parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, the Max Planck Institute uh, has also one. Uh, uh, there is a vaccine that is uh, is a different technology, uh, previously uh, produced for BCG. The mo what follows up is the Moderna, uh, which is an RNA vaccine, uh, and currently is in phase two. And then a lot of uh, vaccines are in phase one, two. Uh, like CanSino and Sinovac from China, um, and then uh, the rest of the, the technologies are further back in phase one, and the majority are still in preclinical studies. So, in terms of technology, we have uh, the nucleic acid vaccines. Uh, what leads the race here is the Moderna. Uh, the BioNTech uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, and then the, some other uh, technologies, Inovio, uh, the Imperial College from London, CureVac. And the idea there is that you have uh, an RNA uh, most likely encapsulated that enters the cell and the RNA tra is transcribed to produce uh, the S protein, the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is then um, uh, elicits an immune response. Then uh, there is the inactivated virus. Uh, what leads here is the Sinovac and Sinopharm. Uh, they're both uh, two Chinese uh, viral uh, vaccines, and. Uh, Possibly it's not a coincidence, uh, China was the first one to have an access to the virus, so uh, they could start earlier on with, uh, with an activated uh, virus approach. The viral vector vaccines are what leads the race at the moment, as I said before, is the Oxford and AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, and they use um, uh, an adenovirus, uh, that is edited to produce the spike protein of the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, other approaches, the CanSino with an adenovirus 5. The Oxford uh, vaccine is a chimpanzee adenovirus. Can CanSino is an adenovirus 5. Uh, Gamaleya Institute is adenovirus uh, 26 and adenovirus 5. Um, so there are different different approaches. Some are adenovirus, human adenovirus. Uh, the only one that is uh, different uh, and perhaps offers uh, some more uh, potential uh, safety is the the chimpanzee adenovirus from AstraZeneca. And then there are the the subunit approaches. Uh, based on the, the, the actual proteins, uh, either M, N, or S, the membrane protein, the spike, or the nucleocapsid. 
and then the, the institute that leads this, uh, these approaches. Now, uh, in Biomanginius, uh, actually, before, uh, before I go to that, um, as our mission is to provide to, to the public uh, a vaccine at the earliest stage possible, we had, um, uh, through our um, uh, prospect, uh, prospection group, uh, we, we evaluated the different technologies. We had um, discussion with, uh, with uh, many of the leading companies in the race, and uh, we looked at the, our production capabilities and internalization capabilities to see which of these technologies were appli applicable to what we could produce here, uh, not only distribute, but produce locally. Uh, considering that uh, the demand for the vaccine would be enormous, uh, the whole world would be looking at vaccinating, we didn't want to just import from uh, whichever company would be developing, uh, we wanted to be able to produce here uh, in our facility. So uh, after various discussions, both with the companies and with the Ministry of Health, we have now got uh, a partnership with AstraZeneca uh, and the Oxford vaccine to be produced locally, and uh, we look at bringing initially 100 million doses in, in two parts, 30 million in the beginning, uh, that will be at the end of this year, and a further 70 million later on. And uh, we are organizing our production capacity to produce some 40 million doses per month uh, here at Biomanginius. And at the same time, we are developing our, our own vaccines. Uh, these are the different vaccine programs that we have. Uh, we, we didn't have access to the virus until, uh, at the, until the end of February or early March when, uh, when Brazil started having the first cases. So uh, technologies like inactivated viral vaccine would be impossible for us. So we had to focus uh, early on to, to a synthetic peptide vaccine or a subunit vaccine. So the two approaches was uh, in silico using computational methods, identifying uh, peptide, antigenic peptides, uh, epitopes of the spike or the nucleocapsid protein. Uh, and then uh, we synthesized those peptides, and when we started having the first cases, we validated this peptide using serum from the patients, and we subsequently formulated those in, uh, in nanoparticles. This is an example of a micelle uh, with uh, the, the peptides on its surface. Uh, we validated the, the nanoparticles, again, using serum of the patients, and we're now at preclinical stages uh, looking at uh, toxicity, immunogenicity, and uh, obviously uh, protection uh, from challenge in challenge models in animals uh, using mice and hamsters, the gold, golden hamster model. This is a gold nanoparticle, again with peptides, and we have both uh, an internal development and a partnership with uh, a UK startup, uh, MRZX, uh, and they're developing peptide-based T-cell uh, vaccines. The difference here is that uh, on our uh, nanoparticle, we have uh, peptides that would elicit both a humoral response, so they would produce more antibodies, uh, but also T cell response to, uh, to produce CD4 and CD8. Uh, CD uh, the MRZX vaccine is specifically for cytotoxic CD8 uh, response uh, uh, with a view to avoid uh, potential antibody enhancement. Uh, this is a problem that has been observed uh, previously on a, on a dengue vaccine, and uh, as the, the development is accelerated, perhaps there's not going to be sufficient time to look for antibody enhancement in current vaccine development. So 
the, the, the solution that MSX uh, proposed and we are, we are participating in the co-development of this vaccine for COVID-19 is that uh, uh, perhaps a, a cellular response would be sufficient uh, to protect without using um, uh, an antibody response. And finally, we have another internal partnership within Fiocruz to use the, the selected peptides on, uh, on a protein scaffold instead, instead of uh, micelles or gold nanoparticles using a beta barrel scaffold with uh, antigenic peptides uh, in the flexible parts of the, of the protein scaffold. And the other approach is, uh, is the subunit, which is uh, obviously was uh, an approach we could take from early on, um, producing both the spike or parts of the spike protein and, uh, and the end, the nucleocapsid, and formulating those with adjuvants for uh, a vaccine development approach. Um, so we, we try to have, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, Biomanguinhos deals with uh, vaccines, biopharmaceuticals, and diagnostics. So we tried within the, the development to have uh, an integrated approach where we started with the molecular diagnostic. It was the first response we had to give. Uh, we then went to the expression of proteins and antigenic peptides, and that fed back to the rapid test, the point of care uh, for the detection of, uh, of antibodies in the patients, and that also formulated into the vaccines uh, and to the immunotherapy unit. We selected uh, or were selecting aptomers and monoclonal antibodies. We understand that this is not, uh, is perhaps uh, at the too early stage to go for a therapeutic approach, but it can certainly feed back also to, to developing a, a rapid test, a point of care test for detection of antigen. So we can detect both antibodies and antigens uh, at the early stage and uh, and then have a vaccine uh, approach we can follow up in uh, 2021 or 2022. Uh, and finally, uh, in partnership with the textile industry in Brazil, we did uh, combined drug and material effort to produce, uh, to validate uh, uh, and, produ and produce antiviral impregnated masks uh, so, uh, we tested different uh, compositions to have masks that uh, can inactivate the virus 99.9% .9 of COVID-19 uh, in less than one minute. Uh, that would potentially increase protection in health uh, professionals, uh, and it could be used for, uh, for any number of, uh, uh, of other professions at this moment. So. Uh, I would finish here, uh, and I'm obviously available for any any questions you have. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you very much uh, once again for the opportunity to present uh, our work here at Fiocruz and Biomagino specifically. Marcos, 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 now it's time to enquete, enquete is number two. We have to, we have to change for layout for more questions that the crowd uh, will answer.
now it's time. Yes, now it's time for the crowd to uh, uh, to uh, to answer some questions from us for thirty seconds. Now, now we're ready for the discussion. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's actually a small molecule synthetic compound, uh, which has initially been developed actually as an anti-cancer agent because these kinases are also important uh, and usually in, in upregulated pathways uh, during cancer development. Uh, and it's quite a while ago that we found out that uh, especially influenza virus, but also other viruses also misuse this kinase for their replication. And, and that's why we could like repurpose it, uh, repurpose an anti-cancer drug for uh, the antiviral uh, approach. Does this answer the question? Actually, it, it uh, so I didn't mention it because it, there, there's no direct uh, evidence of an uh, antiviral uh, action so far. Uh, I'm aware that there were first uh, studies in cell culture, which which looked uh, actually promising. They um, could show that it acted antiviral in, in cell culture. However, the drug also actually had a, a quite uh, broad antiviral activity against different viral um, um, strains, uh, including like HIV, uh, dengue virus. and so on. Uh, it was surprisingly broadly active in cell culture. However, all the further studies in mice, for example, it had been tested uh, um, in mice against Zika virus infections. Um, it was uh, actually uh, not shown to be active there. And uh, finally, I think there was also a phase two, uh, phase three clinical trial in Thailand against dengue virus infections and they unfortunately also could not see um, an, a, a benefit um, in serum levels of the viral proteins or change in viremia or clinical benefit. Uh, so it's, it's still open. Um, there is a chance that the drug might be, might be active. It's, it's worth testing. However, I would uh, uh, really recommend to do like the phase two trials um, to, to really uh, proof of efficacy. And probably I can just answer the next question because it's also on a on a drug which is used in in your country. 
yeah, it, the, the toxin that was also um, a drug and it's Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that uh, that this is even there's even less evidence uh, so far. And uh, thank you for uh, disclosing uh, these these new data that you already tested it also on SARS-CoV-2. Um, there there are some um, I'm aware of uh, some uh, comments or letters in in journals which uh, proposed that there might be a potential role for nitroxanid in treating SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections. However, also there, uh, no further studies besides that what you just mentioned. So I, I'm, I'm uh, said that I'm not aware that there are any uh, cell culture or clinical uh, or, or even uh, mouse studies um, with that, that compound. Um, the, the compound actually acts uh, also anti-inflammatory, and uh, there there might be a chance that it's it's active. But um, this should definitely be tested before it's um, broadly used. I'm actually so I, I feel not not content uh, enough on on the, these material uh, science stuff to to really comment on that. So these uh, silver ions are also uh, uh, like uh, copper copper ions. Uh, they are uh, they are shown that they are anti have antibacterial activity, but uh, I'm not aware now that that this has been tested. Uh, well. We we have uh... sorry. Uh, I think you were cutting a little bit. I I didn't understand some of the. Uh... Of your answer, we we have. Uh, I don't know yeah. if you can hear me. We have uh, tested. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so we did test uh, a number. We did. We did test a number of compounds. Uh, some uh, I don't know the composition, the exact compositions, because there were different institutes uh, and companies that uh, provided this uh, uh, this, this antiviral, potentially antiviral mixture. Some are with silver, uh, are some with copper, uh, or other compounds and. Uh, some of them didn't show uh, significant activity when we tested them uh, against the respiratory virus and specifically uh, the SARS-CoV-2. But, uh, but some of them were very efficient and uh, we had some results, uh, as I said, uh, with some textiles impregnated that uh, uh, had viral inactivation of 99.9% .9 in less than a minute. 
So some of them uh, really work. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be so because uh, actually the the homology between uh, SARS-CoV-1, let's name it like that, and SARS-CoV-2 are the highest uh, in the group of the coronaviruses. So it's uh, these two are very closely related, and uh, the MERS coronavirus is a little bit uh, far off. Um, so th there could be a cross reaction. However, the number of SARS-CoV-1 infected uh, people was actually, or at least the confirmed cases, was quite low. So it was 8,000 or so in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm not aware that um, of any study where they tested like sera um, of SARS-CoV-1 uh, cured patients and then tried uh, cross-reaction on SARS-CoV-2. What we have done um, was to test sera of people that had a confirmed uh, coronavirus infection with these common cold coronaviruses which are circulating also around the world. Uh, there's definitely no neutralizing cross-reaction but they are also quite uh, distantly related evolutionarily to the to the SARS. So, on. so it it, um, it might be so they are actually uh, close enough let's say that there could be a cross-reaction but I'm not aware of any studies that uh, have been done so far to prove that. Yes. So actually, uh, okay. well, okay. Uh, yes, they they have done, uh, and and like uh, Professor Ludwig said, the there is similarity uh, in parts of uh, of SARS CoV one and SARS CoV two. Uh, much more than than with MERS, for example, we had uh, a similar worry on the beginning. Both uh, for the vaccine is not a worry; it would be uh, potentially positive. But for a diagnostic perspective, uh, we know that the N protein is conserved, and uh, part of the S protein is also conserved. So we were worried that potentially could have a, a false positive, but Really, the number of cases uh, worldwide was very low, in Brazil even lower, so that chance would be very remote. Um, and there are some vaccines and, uh, and therapeutic development that uh, are looking at neutralizing uh, both SARS and SARS-CoV-2, uh, or even thinking of, uh, of all coronavirus uh, but these are further back in, in development, so the, the data are not really uh, there to prove that, uh, that this would be Well, I, the I can case. just uh, confirm uh, and, and support what um, Professor Misalidis has, has said, so that's uh, nothing to add, <laughs> perfectly answered. <laughs> Well, 
Yes, yes. Uh, um, well, the result that they they have shown so far uh, in animal studies uh, are very promising. So um, we expect that the there is an efficacious vaccine. Uh, we have looked at the data of the Oxford vaccine. There isn't any adenovirus vaccine in the market so far. So it is a new approach. And uh, uh, previously, there was a problem with an adenovirus vaccine uh, against uh, HIV. That was an, uh, an adenovirus 5. So this is a different uh, adenovirus, uh, simpanzee adenovirus that shouldn't have a, a problem of uh, previous uh, immunization in humans. Um, and it, the, the data show that uh, that is efficacious, uh, so much so that we, we decided to have a partnership with AstraZeneca and we hope to produce this vaccine uh, here. But of course, uh, we can only be certain at the end of the, fa of the phase uh, of the clinical uh, phase three. I'm not aware of any okay. uh, any genetic difference which could uh, which could explain that, uh, which comes that broadly and would really distinguish Asians from Caucasians. Um, there there might be it might be so uh, it, it might not be related to that, but I, I um, there was a suspicion that a certain uh, immunization campaign in, uh, in Russia, and I think it was against some bacterial pathogen, um, would also induce a broad immune response, which would make people uh, more resistant to the infection. And uh, we had we had uh, in eastern and former eastern Germany uh, that this was a mandatory immunization. And uh, we have the observation that the number of cases in eastern, in the former eastern Germany part of, uh, of Germany in these states is much lower than in the western part. Uh, but this is still so far a uh, suspicion and, and only uh, like um, anecdotically uh, observation uh, that it might have something to do with uh, pre-existing immunization against other, um, uh, other pathogens. Uh, so pure speculation so far. Uh, similarly, no, I, I really don't know uh, about the potential genetic difference, but uh, one comment that uh, has attracted my attention uh, independently is exactly that there is a difference between, for example, the number of, uh, of deaths uh, in parts of Europe compared to Brazil, especially given the low adherence to the isolation and uh, uh, 
there are there have been papers published uh, with potential protection with vaccination from BCG uh, from MMR uh, so there are a number of uh, indications but without any uh, solid proof that uh, of, of any one or a number of factors uh, helping or protecting or, or diminishing the severity of the cases uh, but um, Brazil for example has a very very strong immunization program uh, we have more than uh, 14 15 different vaccines uh, in the calendar and uh, great adherence to the uh, immunization so or could that have a, a potential effect it could uh, but there isn't any substantiated evidence uh, that I'm aware of. Was worse. <laughs> yeah, I had some uh, connection problems in the moment, uh, so I don't know whether you hear me. Um, actually, I, I would really, uh, prophylactic-wise, I would really give uh, a, a lot of promise uh, on on plant products. Yeah, and um, because they are uh, different, so we have done a, a quite a bit of studies. Uh, I can hear you now, but it was. Uh, there was a, a lack in the transmission. So now it works. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we worked a lot of on, on plant extracts, uh, on, on several uh, plant extracts, which uh, the most of them, uh, and I think flavonoids are uh, included here, uh, work as uh, anti-adhesives. So uh, we found actually that they would prevent viruses from binding to cells. And this is, uh, of course, something which uh, is the earliest stage uh, where you could inhibit virus infection, which would be very favorable. And in, in that respect, and, and the, the observations we had was that it seems that uh, the ingredients of the, the extracts would, uh, would bind to the pathogen and and prevent uh, so would block the pathogen from binding uh, to cells and and if, if you think about that in terms of, of prophylactic use if you would have uh, like the extracts in your mouth and the viruses come in and uh, and would be like covered with the ingredients uh, during that entry phase into your body uh, that may, may be a, a very good uh, strategy uh, to prevent infection, so actually I would uh, I would give a lot of hope in in these kinds of of uh, like natural product drugs. One problem is that they are in, in most of the cases they are not uh, very well tested and especially not in like advanced clinical trials. Uh, this has something to do, uh, to my opinion, with the fact that you cannot really protect the approaches because you cannot protect 
like a full plant extract. This is nature. This is not patentable in a way. And this prevents um, uh, producers of these extracts to do very expensive clinical trials. But I would, I'm, I'm really uh, very much in favor of, of uh, trying these things and, and looking for, for the potency. Um, we we don't really work with uh, with uh, phytotherapy. I had done uh, in the past in the UK work with flavonoids, but uh, they were mostly in the area of, of cancer. Uh, but yeah, the the like my colleague said, the, there is a potential there, and in fact, there are four. Uh, therapeutic approaches that came up on our uh, prospective studies uh, that are based on phytotherapics that uh, I don't know how far they, they've advanced. Uh, actually, not on SARS-CoV-2, but just in the moment, we have a student from Belo Horizonte, um, from Mauro Teixeira's lab, uh, and, and she works on a, on a mouse model of um, influenza virus bacterial co-infection, uh, and she studies uh, the, the action of melatonin, uh, and, and she did some work on that before, so there is a potency there, yeah, I, will, I think. Uh, but we did not test it so far uh, against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but since since uh, the, the mode of action is more general and more um, yeah, modulating the immune response uh, or the inflammatory response, uh, there's um, uh, that could well be that it also acts uh, against SARS-CoV-2 because it's not a virus-specific event. It's more uh, the fiddling around with the uh, with the immune system. Okay, um, so with the uh, with the testing, uh, like you said, the, the strategy for the molecular. First of all, the price for a molecular biology testing uh, is uh, around a hundred uh, hal, um, which would be um, twenty uh, euros, probably, uh, and. Uh, the strategy of the Ministry of Health at the moment is to test uh, only people who have uh, symptoms and are uh, hospitalized. Uh, it doesn't make sense really to test everybody with a molecular biology testing. Uh, 
if they don't present symptoms uh, as per, and there is no capacity for for that amount of testing not in terms of uh, of having the test we we have tests and we can provide tests much more than we can use them uh, because they need specialized facilities because they need uh, RT-PCR and uh, there is a, a, a whole line for collection sent to the central laboratories uh, for analysis and then receiving the results some days later. So it is very important and it is applied but is applied only in cases that uh, show symptoms that are internalized uh, to confirm that uh, the case is uh, COVID-19. The rapid test, the, the point of care testing is, is a bit different because uh, it's much faster. Uh, you can see if somebody is protected so they can, uh, there has been discussion of having people uh, with some sort of uh, green passport or uh, for, for having antibodies uh, and therefore being able to come back to, to uh, work or uh, so uh, the price is, is smaller the, depending on the test, but uh, in general is much less than, uh, than the PCR based. Uh, and uh, the result is coming out in 15 minutes. So there have been a lot of, uh, there, there have been some criticisms with the rapid test because we ended up having a, a big number of tests that enter the country uh, from various origins and a lot of them were licensed uh, with an emergency license so the testing, uh, the validation of the test was lesser than it would have been on a normal situation uh, but that is slowly overcome uh, as time goes by everything passes from the, the central laboratory for that does the validation uh, and, uh, and the tests are, are getting much more reliable on what we have in the market. Um, so I think it, the, the strategy with the rapid testing is to test uh, a great number of the population and perhaps retest uh, subsequently. But with the molecular biology I think there is, uh, you're right, uh, unless there is an indication of why uh, is not a case of uh, try to test the population. Uh, especially in a country like Brazil that uh, there is a great, uh, there are 200 million people. Now the vaccination is a different, uh, is a different story. Um, the uh, national immunization system is, uh, and the Ministry of Health is who decides the, the vaccination strategy. Uh, companies that are doing trials in Brazil are, are looking at uh, different ages. So, for example, the, the AstraZeneca trial in Brazil is uh, from 18 to 55. Uh, that would probably uh, have a, pre, uh, a first implication of health professionals, people that are more exposed, that um, unless uh, there is an approval from data from the, the trials they do in other countries, that would exclude high risk population that is above 55. That would be on a second uh, moment. And uh, there is another uh, vaccine the, that uh, Putantan Institute in Brazil is, uh, is licensed and they're producing. So it will depend if we have uh, two different vaccines or, or more than two different vaccines in the country. Uh, and that could affect obviously the time of the vaccination plus the logistic of, uh, of getting campaigns uh, for a country that you know, of uh, 200 million people and areas as remote as uh, in some parts of Brazil.
Uh, yes, so I, I uh, um, agree with the fact that uh, testing without any uh, like pre-existing exposure or uh, any symptoms uh, is, is very costly and without a lot of benefit because um, someone who got in touch with an infected person may be negative at one day and already the next day may be positive and, and you, you never know what uh, to do there. Uh, in, in Germany, we now start uh, to test like risk populations, uh, for example, teachers or uh, the, uh, the people coming home from holidays from abroad. Uh, and and uh, so this is also testing uh, of people that have no symptoms. Um, but this is, so I think that the number of people we will find there who are positive without any symptoms uh, will be very, very uh, small. And so this is a very costly uh, strategy and uh, I'm, I'm not uh, so convinced that uh, this, this makes a lot of sense. Actually, uh, can I? Uh, we have uh, we have entered into uh, a collaboration with uh, Germany about looking at the possibility of doing pooling or uh, in, in testing, uh, specifically for big large companies that want to come back. Uh, so instead of testing every every individual, you test in pool and then you open up if you have. Uh, uh, positive cases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe this that, was something that, uh, that you That's were true. doing there. In uh, however, what you, what you do, and, you lose uh, sensitivity. If you pull like uh, 20 samples, you have, uh, of course, the, the, uh, one positive one might not uh, be detected as good as if you have uh, a single sample. Um, and at the end, you have to uh, have to open the pool if you have one positive and then, then retest. And you lose so with pooling, you lose any reliability as the, from from the company on the assays. So they they only guarantee for the accuracy uh, and the sensitivity of the assay uh, if you use it for one one sample. That's a little also a um, a legal problem in a way uh, which we have to deal with uh, in our in our um, hospital. However, it's uh, you're right. It's done in in some. Uh, instances that we pool, uh, especially then uh, if, if there are too many samples which you simply cannot handle uh, in, a, in a decent time. So thank you, Markus, and uh, thank you very much also, Professor Ludwig uh, and uh, Dr. Sotis Mitsavidis. Uh, also from my side, it was a very rich uh, discussion after very interesting uh, presentations. I hope uh, virologists, uh, biologists and researchers like you, as well as physicians and so many professionals, can put an end to this pandemic as soon as possible. Although the success of this fight depends not only on you, but also on measures by governments and people in general. While researchers, health professionals and authorities are fighting COVID-19, people are living under very restrictive conditions to avoid being contaminated 
are exposing themselves to a high risk to be sick. Lifestyle, economy, arts and culture, social relationships and so on have been adapted during the pandemic. This is the approach of our second meeting. I want to invite you for the next DV Hassan Paulo online talk in three weeks on 26th August about the second topic of this series, Living in the Pandemic. Marcus will share the session again and our invited speakers will be Professor Susanne Mürbus from University of Duisburg Athens and Jessica Machado Farias from University of Brasilia. To follow the agenda of our online talk series and the activities of the day in São Paulo, please write down or take a picture of these slides, where is the slide, with our address on internet and social media, as well as our institutional email address to get in contact. Yes, now that is the, uh, the slide, please take uh, notes of the addresses, uh, how you can find us in Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, on internet, and uh, by email. So this uh, online talk was recorded and the video will be available soon uh, on our channel on YouTube as well through our social media. Before we close the this transmission, I ask you once more to answer our survey informing us some anonymous information about your profile and your evaluation of this first De Hassan Paulo online talk. The survey will still open for one minute. After this time, the transmission will be ended. So I thank you very much for participating and have a nice day.